I'm Chris Green, the history chap, telling stories that bring British history to life. The Gurkhas are one of the most loved, fearsome and respected brigades in the British Army. These men from the Himalayan country of Nepal have served in the British Army for 200 years. And yet, it hasn't always been that way. Between 1814 and 1816, the British and the Gurkhas fought a vicious, bloody war, the Anglo-Nepalese War. It was the only time they ever fought each other. The bravery shown by both sides built a mutual respect, and a 200-year tradition of Gurkhas serving in the British Army began, and it continues to this day. Wherever the British have fought, the Gurkhas have tended to be there, armed with their fearsome cockery knives for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They are legendary for their loyalty, ferociousness, and bravery. As former Indian Field Marshal Sam McEnshaw said, if a man says he's not afraid of dying, he's either lying or he's a Gurkha. Here's a case in point. On the 21st of November 1965, in the jungles of Borneo, Lance Corporal Ram Bahadur Lumbu moved forward with 16 members of the 10th Princess Mary's own Gurkha Rifles, British Army. The 21-year-old was patrolling near the Malaysian-Indonesian border, near the town of Bao. They were part of the British Army's support to Malaysia during the Borneo confrontation that had started two years earlier. Suddenly, they ran into an Indonesian patrol, about twice their size. Limbo could see the forward Indonesian trench, and in it, a sentry manning a machine gun. He crawled forward, determined to gain first blood. But when he'd almost reached his objective, the sentry saw him and opened fire. Nevertheless, he rushed the position, killing his opponent. By now, the 30 or so Indonesian troops were firing on his platoon, and Limbu saw two of his men go down hit. Without thinking, he crawled forward towards his fallen comrades, in front of two further Indonesian machine guns, which also opened up on him. Unable to reach his men, he retired a short distance, turned, and then rushed forward. Hurling himself on the ground beside one of the wounded men, he then picked him up and carried him to safety. Without hesitation, he immediately returned for the other wounded man and carried him back through a hail of enemy bullets. It had taken 20 minutes to complete this rescue mission, and for all but a few seconds, this Gurkha NCO had been moving alone in full view of the enemy and under continuous fire from automatic weapons. Having saved the two men, he went back on the offensive, killing four more Indonesians as they tried to flee from the Gurkhas. For this act of gallantry, Lance Corporal Limpu was awarded the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest military medal for valour. He was the most recent of 26 men from British Gurkha regiments to be awarded the VC. His actions almost epitomised the legendary status of the Gurkhas. These soldiers from the Himalayas, who have served in the British Army for nearly 200 years. And yet, before they ever served in the British Army, there was a moment in time where the British had to take on these fearsome warriors. The loyalty, respect and friendship that since then they've created with their British brothers in arms was forged in a series of bloody battles in the foothills of the Himalayas. And it all happened at around the same time that Wellington was defeating Napoleon at Waterloo. The Gurkhas hail from the mountain nation of Nepal, squeezed in between India and China, or more precisely Tibet, with their capital at Kathmandu. In the late 18th century, the Gurkha rulers of Nepal started to flex their muscles, moving east into Sikkim and north into Tibet. This latter advance was checked by the Chinese, who moved an army swiftly into Tibet to protect what they considered to be their sphere of influence. Having also met firm resistance from the Sikhs in the west, the Gurkhas, or we can now call them the Nepalese, turned their sights to the south. For some time, they had been eyeing up the wealthy Indian state of Old. The only slight fly in the ointment is that the ruler, or Nawab of Old, was under the influence of the British East India Company. Old would actually be one of the key regions that revolted during the Indian Mutiny in 1857. But that, as they say, is another story, although one I have told in the past, so check it out at the end. But as the Gurkhas had very little history with the British, they weren't unduly phased by the Nawab of Old's warning that he had a big brother. Thus, in 1801, they moved south, encroaching on his territory. The British protested at this move, but did nothing else, 
and so the Nepalese stayed put. Just over a decade later, in 1813, the emboldened Gurkhas moved deeper into the Indian state. This time, the British East India Company did come to their clients' aid, sending troops to support the Nawab eject the intruders. Unsure exactly how dangerous the East India Company were, the Nepalese moved back across the border, only to reappear when the British withdrew for the rainy season. As they swept into old, they stormed three police stations, killing a British officer. For the Governor-General of Bengal, Lord Hastings, this was a step too far. He declared war on the Kingdom of Nepal on the 1st of November, 1814. The Anglo-Nepalese War had started. On paper, it was an unequal war. The Gurkhas versus the British Empire. But whilst technology certainly favoured the British, the terrain favoured the Gurkhas. The British had scant knowledge of Nepal and little experience of mountain fighting. The Gurkhas, on the other hand, knew the terrain off the back of their hands, and they also knew how to fight in it. Let's find out what happened next. Lord Hastings assembled an army of 22,000 to deal with the Nepalese. Based at Lucknow from where he intended to oversee the campaign, Hastings divided his army into four columns. Colonel Sir David Ochtoloni would lead a force of 6,000 men entirely consisting of Indian troops from the west. General Gillespie would lead 3,500 men from the east. His force would include about 1,000 British troops, drawn from the 53rd Regiment of Foot, later the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, and the 8th Dragoons. Meanwhile, Generals Wood and Marley would command the two strongest columns advancing in the centre, from the south. Bennett Marley's column was the bigger of the two, standing at around 8,000 men, including the 24th Regiment of Foot. Later the South Wales borderers, you might know them for their actions in two epic battles of the Anglo-Zulu War, at Isandwana and Rourke's Drift. Marley would also be accompanied by four 18-pound guns and eight smaller artillery pieces, plus over a dozen mortars. Major General John Sullivan Wood commanded the other central column of about 4,500 men, principally infantry, including the British Army's 17th Regiment of Foot, later the Leicestershire Regiment. By the time the British Army had gathered, the Nepalese had long gone from old and had retreated into the safety of their mountain kingdom. The first blow that the British struck was in the east, where General Gillespie attacked a fort at Kalunga. The fort, set against the backdrop of the snow-covered Himalayas, was in an impressive setting, with steep crevices protecting it. It was only defended by 600 Gurkhas. Gillespie, on the other hand, had nearly five times that number. Major General Sir Robert Rollo Gillespie is yet another one of those incredible characters from the British Empire. An Irishman who early in his military career had been acquitted for killing a man in a duel. He then served in the Caribbean during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, where he had survived a bout of yellow fever, being shipwrecked and fired upon while swimming ashore with a white flag to negotiate the surrender of the French garrison in Haiti. When eight intruders entered his lodgings in what is now the Dominican Republic, he had fought them off single-handedly with his sword, killing six of them. Transferring to the Army of the East India Company, he had commanded the advance expedition that had captured Batavia on Java from the Dutch, and famously then falling out with one Stamford Raffles. <laughs> reads like a novel, but it's a true story. Would you like to hear about the life and career of Robert Rollo Gillespie? Well, I'm going to tell his story in a special YouTube Live episode, especially for my members. So if you want to hear it, then click on the Join button below. You can always leave afterwards, although <laughs> I hope you don't, as I've got lots more members specials planned. Anyway, let's get back to that first action of the Anglo-Nepalese War. Gillespie manoeuvred his men into position for the tricky assault on the fort. But before he could advance, the outnumbered Gurkhas launched their own attack. Despite being only a fifth of the size of their British opponents, they sallied out of the fort and assaulted the British lines. Steadying his sepoys, who were somewhat taken aback by the suddenness and ferocity, they returned fire, and this is where their numbers counted. Despite their bravery, the Nepalese were forced to fall back on the fort. And as they retreated back to the fort, Gillespie decided that he would chase them and enter through the open gate. He ordered his British troops, the 53rd Regiment of Foot and the 8th Dragoons forward. For this particular action, 
the dragoons were dismounted, so fighting as infantry. Later on in their history, as the 8th Hussars, and once again on their horses, they would participate in the charge of the Light Brigade. However, as the British closed in on the narrow gate, it was their turn to be met by a hail of concentrated fire, this time from the Gurkhas. Sword in one hand, pistol in the other, Gillespie urged his men forward. And then, just 30 metres from the fort's gate, he fell, mortally wounded, shot through the heart. 30-year-old Lieutenant Frederick Young, an officer in the 13th Native Infantry, carried the stricken commander back down the hill. And witnessing the demise of the leader, and with his track record, they must have thought he was pretty indestructible, the British attack collapsed. A further attack a few days later fared no better. Once more, the British forced a breach in the entrance. Ordered to attack with fixed bayonets, the British troops took one look at the Gurkhas armed with their kukris and bolt. The two assaults cost the British over 700 casualties, including Gillespie, and it achieved nothing. Eventually, after a month, Colonel Seabright Morby decided to use cannon to bombard the fort. This, and cutting the defenders' water supply, finally resulted in a British victory. But even then, the Gurkhas showed their fighting prowess and never-say-die attitude, as the final 70 defenders charged out of the fort and fought their way through the British lines. Behind them lay 500 Gurkhas, killed or injured, inside the fort. So impressed with the British by the Gurkhas' valour, that they actually raised an obelisk in front of the fort to honour the Gurkha dead. A month later, another attack, this time at the fort at Jithak, also ended miserably for the British. A Gurkha counterattack, using their fearsome cockery knives, threw the sepoys into confusion, and the invaders lost another 300 men killed or injured as they retreated. In the centre, Major General Wood's column was making slow progress, and also meeting stiff resistance. And so, the general withdrew to his starting position. Meanwhile, the largest column, under Major General Bennett Marley, was faring no better. Once again, stubborn resistance and spirited counterattacks by the Nepalese were blunting his advance on Kathmandu. Deciding to dig in, he fortified his position and placed uh, two smaller forts, uh, fortifications in front of his main camp. It didn't take long for both of these outlying camps to be overrun by the Nepalese, with the British losing 125 killed, 87 wounded and 73 missing. Going nowhere, being attacked by fearless enemies, morale in the main camp began to give way, and some of the sepoys started to desert. Hastings decided to bolster Marley's faltering advance by sending him a further 4,000 reinforcements. However, the British general, despite now having 12,000 men under his command, somehow came to the conclusion that he was facing an even bigger enemy force, up to 18,000, made up of their very best troops. Actually, it seems that the Nepalese army in front of him was more like 8,000, many of whom were poorly armed and were merely from the local militias. Nevertheless, it was all too much for Mali. Possibly suffering from some sort of breakdown, he deserted his own army on the 10th of February. So, after three months, here's the situation in early 1815. The British had made no progress in the east or the centre. They'd lost the best part of 1,000 men killed or wounded. General Gillespie was dead, and General Marley had gone AWOL. Only Colonel Ochtoloni over in the west was making any sort of progress. Entering Nepalese territory from Ludhiana in Punjab, he captured the fort at Nalogur after a 30-hour bombardment and was now advancing into the Mountain Kingdom. Not only was the war definitely not going to script, but Hastings was well aware that these setbacks could embolden enemies elsewhere in India. Punjab Sikhs, the Afghans, the Marathas. The stakes couldn't be higher. This war had to be brought to a successful conclusion, or at least successful from a British perspective, as fast as possible. He decided to take a huge risk. He would denude other East India Company armies on the subcontinent to win in Nepal. By the end of February 1815, the British army facing the Gurkhas had been swelled to 40,000 men. Lord Hastings also decided 
to place the only commander who seemed to be getting the hang of this mountain warfare, David Ochtoloni, in charge of the whole campaign. By the end of March, Ochtoloni had reached Bulaspur, reducing every fort he met with artillery. He now faced possibly the most able Gurkha general, Umar Sin, who had positioned himself in a string of mountainous forts across his path on the road to Kathmandu. The British general marched his army 5,000 feet up the Himalayas during the winter. Engineers blast through rocks to create a road for his 18-pounder guns, which were dragged by elephants. And then, in a night attack, he captured two outlying forts, forcing Sin back along a higher ridge towards another fort, which he then proceeded to attack. In that ensuing attack, Umar Sin once more showed the defiant and brave attitude that the Gurkhas have to this day. Standing within range of the British muskets, identified by his personal colours planted in the ground next to him, he proceeded to organise the defence with an absolute disdain to his personal safety. Despite Sin's bravery and that of his troops, who repeatedly counterattacked, the British eventually carried the day. But that victory had come at a high price, over 200 British dead or wounded. And meanwhile, the Gurkhas had suffered twice that many casualties. Once more, each side had earned the respect of the other. Umar Sin had managed to escape to fight another day, but the tide was turning against him and the Nepalese cause. By the end of April, a provisional capital, Almora, had been captured, and the morale of Amur Sin's men started to break. Many deserted. Some even went over to the British. By mid-May, the Gurkha general had just 200 men left with him. He finally surrendered on the 15th of May, and General Ochtoloni allowed his adversary to march out of his fort with his own personal possessions. As he passed, the British guns fired a salute. With the defeat of Umar Singh, the proud Gurkhas now sued for peace. The British demanded that the western areas of Nepal be ceded to the East India Company, along with much of the lowland region in the south, nearly a third of the territory of the kingdom. Furthermore, a British resident, or diplomat, must be allowed to dwell in Kathmandu. In return, the British recognised that the Gurkhas had not been subjugated. Nepal was still independent. A peace treaty was signed in November 1815 and ratified by the East India Company in Calcutta just before Christmas. And then something unforeseen happened. The Nepalese Durbar, or Council of Elders, refused to ratify the treaty. The war was back on. Ochtoloni now advanced with 20,000 troops from the east in February 1816. Finding his way blocked by three lines of entrenched Gurkhas, he led a brigade on a night-time march and the following day appeared behind the Gurkha positions, complete with elephants dragging guns. So surprised were the Gurkhas that they uncharacteristically fled without firing a shot. It had been such a daring and rapid advance that Ochtoloni and his men now had to spend four days huddled on a Himalayan hillside in the winter without tents, waiting for the rest of the column to catch them up. With the column reunited, the British began their final advance on Kathmandu, and the Gurkhas retreated in front of them. The British caught up with their quarry about 20 miles east of the capital. Having captured a village, the British then faced a ferocious counterattack by 2,000 Gurkhas, which was only driven off by a charge by the eight native infantry. And then the British six-pounders added to the carnage. Whilst the British lost 45 killed and 175 wounded, the Gurkhas lost 800 men and all their artillery. It was a devastating defeat. The Nepalese Durbar now had a change of heart and sent envoys stating that they would accept the treaty after all. And with that, the Anglo-Nepalese War of 1814 to 1816 was over. The Treaty of Saguli reimposed Hastings' original conditions. A third of Nepal passed to British India and remains part of the Republic of India to this day. The British and Gurkhas never fought each other again. Nepal would remain independent and whilst an ally of the British, was never subsumed into the British Empire. Hastings would fall out with the East India Company and resigned in 1821, becoming governor of Malta, where he died in 1826. Somewhat amazingly, Major General Marley, the commander who had deserted his own army, was never reprimanded. In fact, 
He continued his military career, rising to the rank of general before dying in 1842. Completely bonkers, isn't it? Colonel David Ochtoloni was promoted to Major General, awarded the Order of the Bath, and received a parliamentary vote of thanks. But his star didn't rise for long. Less than 10 years later, he also fell out with the East India Company and resigned. He died a year later, in 1825, in Delhi, aged 67. And his name is pretty much forgotten to history. However, his legacy lives on. The British respected the warrior spirit of the Gurkhas, and the Gurkhas in return admired the fighting prowess of the British soldiers so far from home. As one Gurkha soldier said of the British, they're as brave as lions, and nearly equal to us. In 1815, even whilst the war was still in progress, Ochtoloni was so impressed by them that he formed a battalion of Gurkhas in his own army. It would later become the first King George's own Gurkha rifles. With the ending of the Anglo-Nepalese War, further battalions were created. They would go into action within two years, fighting in the Anglo-Maratha War, and became a small but highly respected and effective part of the British Army thereafter. They would fight in three Sikh Wars, three Burmese Wars, and three Afghan Wars. In the Second Afghan War in 1882, the Gurkhas joined the Gordon Highlanders in a bayonet charge which effectively won the Battle of Kandahar. During the Indian Mutiny, the Gurkhas, along with the British 60th Regiment, famously held Hindu Rao's house during the Siege of Delhi, withstanding 26 attacks and sustaining 75% casualties from 490 men. In the 20th century, they served with distinction in both the First World War, where they were present on the Western Front, the Salonika Front, and in the Middle East, and in the Second World War. In World War II, over 200,000 Gurkhas fought in North Africa, Italy, and against the Japanese. They suffered over 30,000 casualties. After Indian independence in 1947, six regiments transferred to the Indian Army, including the original regiment formed by General Ochtoloni, whilst four regiments transferred to the regular British Army. The Indian Army now has 12 battalions of Gurkhas, about 42,000 men. Meanwhile, 4,000 men serve in the Brigade of Gurkhas in the British Army. They consist of two battalions of the Royal Gurkha Rifles, and also multi-cap units of Gurkha engineers, logistics and signals. Every year, thousands of young Nepalese men apply to join the Gurkha Brigade in the British Army, with only the very best making the grade. During their 200-year history fighting in the British Army, members of the Gurkha regiments have been awarded 26 Victoria Crosses. The last of which was awarded to Lance Corporal Rambahudua Limbu for his actions in Borneo in 1965. Which brings us full circle in our story. The last Gurkha VC recipient eventually rose to the rank of captain and died in 2023, aged 83. He is just one in a long line of Gurkhas who have and who continue to serve in the British Army. His actions in Borneo typified the legend and reality of these amazing soldiers, whose motto is, it's better to die than to live like a coward. Well, thanks for joining me today and I hope you enjoyed that story. Don't forget to join my membership channel here on YouTube for more exclusive stories from British history, starting with General Gillespie, whose adventures are like something from a novel, <laughs> except they're true. Hit the join button below to get that story and more. Thanks for your support. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.